Today's lecture is about declarative UI and Vadin Designer. For the overview of today's lecture, basically two, two bullet points. One is the declarative UI and then the other one is Vadin Designer. Let's start with declarative UI. The first time I heard about this, this was my reaction. And what does it do? It all comes to the distinction between programming languages. So the imperative and the declarative ones. That's one of the many classifications of programming languages. But this one is like pretty obvious. So imperative is almost all the languages that you know. Program written in such a language is a solution to the problem. Declarative, according to Wikipedia, is an expression of logic of computations without an actual control flow. This is slightly cryptic, but it's a description of a solution to the problem, not the solution itself. So you basically tell what needs to be done without worrying how exactly it's going to be done. And what does that mean in the UI? It means that we are declaring the UI. So we are just focusing on components, their hierarchy, we assign some names, properties and the like. But we are completely ignoring the fact how UI works. So we are not assigning any events to the components that we create. There is no interaction between those components and this is left to kind of the real code. There are a few benefits. First is that we focus more on the code. So now we have this distinction between the UI declaration, so the part where we describe how the UI is structured, and then we have the part where we tell what this UI is doing. Which means that from each of those parts we leave the things that are not important there. This also means that we can reuse the declared UIs in different contexts. And as I said, it's the separation of concerns. So the UI is no longer constructed in the code that deals with the functionality of that code. That also means it can be designed independently somewhat. So you still need to agree on some sort of an interface or a common functionality. The biggest drawback, in my opinion, is that there is a significant overhead. The declared UI must be generated somehow in your application. So it's not that it comes for free. To some extent, we pollute the code with another language, which is the language of the declarative UI. Because most likely you will not declare UI in Java, because well, why would you do that? To some extent, this reduces readability of the code. I mean, if you use some cryptic declarative UI language, then that might actually cause headaches for the developers who are used to Java. These are the like, principles of the declarative UIs. So you use some sort of a file to tell what components are there, what are their basic properties, and then that's it. You leave that to your application to read that, generate the UI, construct objects, and then use functional code to actually bind them together. So the wiring of the UI is left to the application. In Vardin, in, in the core framework since version 7.5, if I'm not mistaken, we have the Vardin declarative format, which means you can declare UIs using Vardin declarative format, and then the framework will wire it up for you. Basically, it is something like custom elements in HTML file. So you need an HTML file that has a single root. And then the translation is kind of very straightforward. So a Vadin component is turned into an HTML tag prefixed with Vadin and then the component name. And if there is a setter for a foo property, then that property is actually a, an attribute of that HTML element. Of course, a limited subset of attribute types is supported. So only a, like strings, numbers, I think, booleans and enums are supported. The good thing is that this is supported by all components and it's completely transparent to all the other components. So here is the trick that you do. So you apply the annotation on a class that matches the design root, and then you just tell design to read a file. And the file must be in the resources of your application. So instead of talking about this format, I can just show you an example. So this is a very typical Vadin application snippet. So you have a vertical layout into which you add components. The declarative version of that it is HTML file that contains a Vadin vertical layout and then Vadin text fields, three of them actually, and captions would be name, street, and code as they appear here. That could be any component. So it can be, if you replace this text field, for example, with the checkbox, you can change the code here, Vadin checkbox, and it would appear. Of course, once you have this declarative site, you don't need this code anymore. because this will be equivalent. So if you read the design, it's going to produce this structure. 
Okay, so this is what the framework offers. And I said that each component is capable of using a design file or using a declarative way of creating an interface. And that also applies to custom components. Previously, I have been showing you a custom component, even with a client side code called flat select that we are using in our application. So our class flat select is located in the package and it extends an abstract select and so on and so on. So how can we use this one with a declarative format if it's in a different package? Because actually all the padding components, they are in compadding.ui. The solution is very simple. In the head part of the HTML, we just add a package mapping and then we assign this prefix to this package. And then instead of having varin dash component name, we have our prefix dash component name. Few words about how this actually binds the properties to attributes of the HTML file. Whatever data comes inside the tag is pretty much component specific. You can refer to varin.com API for details. An attribute corresponds to a setter that name and only strings, numbers, booleans, and enums are supported. There is another trick for those components who contain other components, so for mostly for layouts, but not necessarily. If an attribute in the tag starts with a column and then follows a property name, that is actually called on a container component, and the current component is passed as a parameter. Another question regarding the declarative format is how do we actually know which component is which in the code? This is the way to do it. You have to have a underline ID attribute with a name. And then in the corresponding Java class, we need to have a field. And if we read the design from this file in this class, then this will be automatically set up in the process. A quick summary of, of that format. It's quite straightforward, I would say. I mean, there's not much magic happening behind the scenes, or at least when you look at it. Uh, the biggest thing is that there is no event handling, as you could expect from a declarative format. There is some overhead. There is some division of work possible. So the details about the structure of the UI are hidden. Well, you need the explicit call to, to read the design in the constructor, but that's about it. So can we do something in practice with our shoutbox? It's currently done in, in a massive code. You know, we're just telling how exactly we want those things. So there needs to be a, a text field with a caption and a button and then what else? A top layout with margins, like all those things we have here in the code. And some of them, they are actually irrelevant to the behavior of our application because they're just arranging the components. We don't really need them here. Can we do something about it? Pretty much everything that you see here can be declared in, in a form of an design or an HTML file. We just need an extension of a CSS layout because that's what we are using somewhere here. Oh, there. So we set the content of our application to a CSS layout, which contains all the elements that we need. Knowing what things correspond to which HTML tags, you can pretty much guess that this is the thing on the left. Like you can just read through it. It contains a CSS layout with some style names, which is full size, which contains a horizontal layout in which we have a text field with a caption and an input prompt and a button with a caption shout. And after the horizontal layout comes a flat select. And after that comes a panel, which is our placeholder for the views. That's what we need. Certain components here, the panel has an ID, the room selection has an ID, and the button and the text, they have ID. I don't actually know why the horizontal layout has an ID. It should be. Anyway, this, this, let's just read these four components. They are the ones that we actually need in our software. We need a text field, we need a button, and we need a placeholder to display the views. And we need the, the room select for navigation. But all the layouts, all the CSS layout, the vertical layout, the horizontal layout, we don't really care. It could have been done completely differently. Now that you know that it should look like this, let's not do it. I mean, uh, it would be pointless for me to sit and code and tell you that when you read this, it's going to work. Well, it's going to work. But there must be a better way to do it. I mean, instead of just, you know, typing stuff in, in HTML files. And there is. It's called Vanin Designer, and it's a drag and drop editor, pretty much. I call it not WYSIWYG, but WYSIWYG, which stands for what you see is almost what you get, because of some peculiarities of CSS. And most often you get pretty much accurate representation of 
of what's there. The backend of the of the editor is the HTML file, and the Java file, the, the file that corresponds to it, is auto-generated. So you don't even have to care about that, which also means you shouldn't edit that file. Once the design, designer creates that file, you should just leave it in place. It says in a couple of places there that you shouldn't edit the file. It's in the comments, it's in an annotation, and somewhere else. So just don't. It's an extra paid feature of Odin, but you can get a free trial license if you want. And it's distributed as a plugin to Eclipse and IntelliJ. Why is it good? First of all, it gives you an instant feedback on the design. So while you're dropping the things, somebody who is like non-technical, but you know, pays the project and makes decisions about it, he can be present or she can be present. And they can like instantly tell you whether they like it or not. What it also does is that it sets up a local preview server on your machine, which reflects the changes on the fly and allows you to connect to that from different devices. One of the advantages is also that it's quite easy to create the stuff. I mean, you just drag and drop things. A non-technical person and, and not a software developer can do it. And it's quite easy to include that in the development process and construct, for example, wireframes for your projects. Of course, there are some limitations. It's not that it, it's a marvelous product that works uh, with everything. Most of the limitations are also caused by the limitations of the declarative format. So only the like the simplest cases or not the very complex cases can be represented there. There is no real support for custom components or, or add-ons. This means that the component is actually rendered as a placeholder and not its actual content. So you can't see how it will look on the final screen. There is no support for data. It's kind of hard to bind it with real data. You have to still do the binding manually. As I said, this comes from the limitations of the declarative format. Only the simple properties are editable. And again, no support for events. And this is like a purely design decision that for now, the designer will focus well on, the, on designing the stuff, not on uh, implementing anything. Well, the question is, do you need it? Well, in most likely not. I mean, if you're doing a simple project or a single view project, then I think there is very little point in using it. But anything that is slightly bigger, it requires some planning on how the UI will look. I would say that you can benefit from it. Now we can actually go to the, to the demo and create a declarative UI with, with designer. And the only thing we will be left with is adding an event binding part manually. In IntelliJ, one would start with a new volume design, fill all the details. I'm pretty sure the Eclipse version is similar. Then, of course, you get a NAG screen about registering, so you just paste the license code here. This is what I found slightly weird, but if you remember the previous rule for designing for no data, well, the designer team actually didn't follow it. So you're welcome with an empty screen, and that's it. It would be nice if there would be some sort of a hint that, you know, on the right-hand side, you have icons because you really have icons here on the right-hand side. And those icons you can drop here just by dragging. And this is, this is the page that we are currently developing. So, And here you can see little icons that correspond to jigsaw elements, and they are project components. So the components that are defined in the project, but as I said, a limitation of designer prevents you actually from seeing how they will look like. After a while, you can construct this, which should look familiar. Here you can see the drag and drop version. So if you don't like it, you can do various things with it. So for example, let's move the button to the left. Can we do it? Yes. So now the button is on the left. Here is an icon for the HTML file. So if you edit this file, it will be reflected in the, or it should be reflected in the design. So I just changed the prompt and you can see that it has been updated here. So it doesn't really matter if you're working with a drag and drop editor or if you're editing an HTML file. Then there is a corresponding Java code in here. And you can see it says here, do not edit this file. And you even have an annotation that says auto-generated. So that it gives you a hint that it's actually something that maybe you shouldn't touch. And you can see that all the components that I have named, they are actually as protected fields here. And the only thing the constructor does is 
that it reads the design for this particular class. Another nice feature that I really like about the Vadin Designer is that you have a QR code for a preview. But what I can do is that I can open this in a browser. Here is the browser window. And so that just that you get the feeling that it really works the way I advertised it. So you can see the thing here. And let's say I just move the button to another plate. Well, I can move this whole thing below maybe. So we will have rooms on the top. Can I do it? And you can see that this actually has been reflected automatically. So it's very nice in, in terms of previewing the page live on, on different devices. And here in the lower part, you can see that list of properties that you can edit and you can type them here. So a button, you can change the caption from shout to say something, for example, and then it should be automatically updated. And as I said, it's the same effect if you would just modify the HTML file. So what's left from that is, as I said previously, binding it to some real code. So how we actually make those components do something instead of just sit there and, and look pretty. The current recommended tactic is to extend the design, the Java file that is automatically generated by the designer or the Java file that corresponds to your HTML design. In the designs constructor, we read the HTML file. So in the subclass, we can just you know, call the superclass constructor and that's it. Reading the design constructs the UI components. So at the point we are actually in the subclass constructor, the components are already there. Yes, all the components that we name with an ID, they are protected, so we can use them in the subclass. And we just implement extra stuff as we need it. It looks like this. So our Shoutbox app, this is the Shoutbox UI that I was showing you previously, like in all its entirety. So you can see that everything that relates to laying out the components, binding the events, everything is gone from here. Now it's called main layout, which we create a new main layout with messages and rooms. And then, well, some navigator, we get a placeholder from that main layout and that's it. And what is a main layout? It is a subclass of our main design, which contains the stuff that is relevant to the behavior of our application. So we're listening to events, we're making it responsive. We have some properties. We have room select, that which we use to navigate to somewhere. Nothing in the terms of how the overall structure of the UI is constructed is here. Nothing like this. None of the stuff that was here previously about how you should, you know, put a horizontal bar, a horizontal layout, put components, assign the expand ratios, set styles of those buttons. Nothing is here. It's just the, the functionality. And all that is done in this HTML file. And the whole magic is then in this line that reads the design from the HTML file, creates the components, assigns them to those fields, and we can use them here just as, we, as they would almost be declared here. The designer approach, so the way that the designer works, the biggest pro, it clearly separates the UI from, from code. So you can have parallel design, you, can, you, you get the separation of concerns. You get reusable designs, so once you settle up on how the login screen should look like, for example, then you can just stuff it in all your applications. And to some extent, you also have a reusable code. To some extent means that you always need this Java class that is auto-generated by the designer or the one that you write yourself that's bound to the design file. And you always need that as a base for kind of the reusing part. Disadvantages, there is a bit more files to keep track of. So the thing that was previously in one file is in three files a design file, design Java class, and the subclass of the design Java class. There is an extra language. Well, it's an HTML, but still, previously, so far, all our code was in Java, and now we are just adding HTML to it. It's yet another tool in the tool chain, so it's a bit extra. Not everything can be done in parallel. As I said, there are some things that you need to decide. 
And the fields are not private, so for those who are really purists in terms of class design, then this might be a drawback. That basically sums up the today's lecture. So I hope you got a glimpse of what is the Varin declarative format and why is it okay to use to declare the UIs in HTML rather than in Java. And then a showcase of what Varin Designer is.